Fleet Management and Vehicle Tracking Company Digicore Holdings reported a 10% rise in diluted headline earnings per share to 22.2 cents for the year ended June 2011. A final dividend of 3 cents per share was declared for a total dividend of 6 cents per share for the year unchanged from a year ago. Digicall market cap, 720 million, a price earnings of just over 13 and a dividend yield of 2.1. Craig, hi, let's come to you in Cape Town first. I, I like their business model in a sense where they're looking to, to do the R&D in, in, in Cape Town, Stellenbosch, just down the road from you, where it's cheap, sell it globally. And they're starting to expand. I get the sense that things are starting to come together for them. Yeah, look, I mean, they've been research, uh, investing quite a lot in R&D and other capital expenses and um, obviously setting themselves up for growth in the international market. And I think that's where it's going to happen for them. Obviously, if the RAND uh, gets weaker, as we've seen this week, that's going to be a good thing for them going forward. And they're positioning themselves well. Um, spent quite a lot in capital. And what's interesting about their business model is um, unlike their competitors that outsource a lot of their work, be it installation and monitoring and even some, to some degree the sales, they like to keep everything in house. So they have spent quite a lot in setting up those infrastructures uh, foreign, uh, uh, you know, internationally, as well as um, on, on developers or as they call it, engineers yeah, here in the Cape. Craig, why was there such a large disparity between the sales growth and the revenue growth? Surely there should be some alignment between the two. Well, as I say, it's, it's, it's got a lot to do with the increased uh, costs, basically operating costs that they're bringing on stream now for growth further down. So uh, you have seen, uh, as I say, a bit of growth on, on, on revenue, although that's also perhaps not where uh, one would have expected. But um, they've increased those operating costs. So when, when times are bad for this type of company, they're really horrid. When they're good, they're really good because they're managing to keep those, uh, those costs down. And we've seen that in the past with this company. Jonathan, I want to come bring it to you on the wall. Oh, there's the chart just perfectly in time. Uh, you're doing this weekly chart again, lack of liquidity. And in fact, this goes all back to their listing in Q2 of, of 2007. Talk us through, if nothing else, we're seeing a stock that's going nowhere since, uh, what, uh, early 2009? Well, basically, I mean, this is the kind of thing that one would be looking for. It's a nice trading range between 2 Rand 60 and 4 Rand. You can see this going since the second quarter of 2008. But uh, again, I mean, one needs to be really assessing what is actually happening inside of this trading range. And this chart below me here is the on-balance volume. Now, I've mentioned it a number of times on the show about the on-balance volume. That's your, your smart money. In well, that's the smart money, sense. exactly. And I think just for the viewer's sake, um, just to how it's calculated, this is, it's the sum total of volume. And which means that it's very difficult to split up exactly how many buyers or how many sellers there are in, the, in exactly in, in the day. So basically, it's calculated by if the day finishes higher than the previous day, the volume is added to the sum total. And if the day finishes lower than the previous day, then it's deducted from the sum, to sum total. And this basically is telling us that on the days that are finishing lower, there's much greater volume than the days that are finishing higher. So therefore, the smarter money is more pressure on the selling side or is leaving the stock. Craig, I want to bring it back to you in Cape Town. We had Remgro results out just a little while ago. Uh, they used to own a, a large stake in Tracker, which they sold for $1.2 billion. Does that uh, suggest that perhaps they're getting out of an industry that's become overly competitive? Or, or would we say that really we're not comparing apples with apples here and, and not worry about what Remgro is doing in the sector? In the, I think in the general tracking uh, side, there's, there's a, extremely a lot of competition. But what they're trying to do is differentiate themselves on, on fleet management add-ons. So it's not just uh, GSM tracking. And um, that's where basically the engineering and the software development is, is coming in line. And uh, that, from that point of view, it's, it's pretty good. They're not the cheapest uh, product in the market, but they offer a lot more than some of the competitors. Yeah, I mean, you talk about it, it's driver behavior. That they're very bullish on their discovery insure, where they, they, they're monitoring drivers in a sense. They seem to think that's something going forward. And that's the sort of R&D that you're talking about, where in that space they can record how you're driving, not just where the vehicle is. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, they've indicated in their prospects that this is perhaps something that they can take to other insurers globally. I'm not sure whether that will be in partnership with Discovery. You obviously have tentacles in other countries as well. But um, just the fact that uh, Discovery have done their due diligence, chosen to partnership with uh, with uh, Digicore on this one, and it's a pretty unique product in the short-term market, I think there could be some, some growth even locally, even if they don't get uh, into the offshore market with this product.
bringing it back to Yonatan on the wall. Yonatan, what are the chances of a break below 260? Could we actually train in the range, buy at 260 and sell at 4 and? I think this is a, this is a great range to be trading. Again, one, one needs to be really aware of the 260 low. And I think that, that uh, the risk that one is taking as it gets closer to the 260 is a lot less. But uh, I think that there's a higher probability that eventually the stock will break below this according to the on-balance volume. But in the, in the meantime, in the short term, we can certainly look to play the range between the 260 and the 4 Rand level. Craig, back to you. You, you, you mentioned that they're, that they're more than just the other folks in Tracker and other names spring to mind who kind of put something in your car, GSM, and then leave it. 35%, sorry, 38% of their business is consumer focused. They really are into, into fleet management. They've done some big deals with a, a Kuleni tender for 6,000 units. South African Police Service added almost another 12,000. Suppose the consumer is nice, but that real profitability, the real money is going to be more in, in, in fleet management. Yeah, and they've indicated that they're trying to grow that annuity book. And I think, in fact, if you look at the total business, most of the annuity income is lying on the fleet management side. And that's obviously where their focus is and where the, um, where the volumes are and the growth in, the, in, in, in revenue. So um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a positive. Um, you know, we haven't mentioned too much of the negative, but what concerns me a little bit is they had a rights issue. Um, and they have they had they not had that rights issue, there would have been a, a, a terrible strain on cash because we've seen their debtors book or their trade receivables increase quite a bit, the operating cash flow decrease a little bit. So there is that little bit of a strain because conditions are not uh, are not uh, at, at their best for the uh, vehicle market. And how do you feel then, notwithstanding the rights issue, Craig? Would you say that Digicore is a hot stock or not? Well, I'd actually like to see how things play in the next six months. So I wouldn't be buying yet. It is a share that I have traded in the past, but there's quite large spreads now, not the liquidity that there used to be, so I wouldn't say it's hot. Not hot for Craig. What about you, Yonatan? OBV, no, smart money on a downward trend. How do you feel about digital? I tend to agree with Craig. I don't, th I don't think it's hot for the, uh, for, 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 for the longer term period, but I think that certainly from a risk for reward ratio, from a trader's perspective, this is more of a speculative hot for me speculative hot for traders. Simon Brown, how do you feel about Digicorp? I, I, I like the company, I like the business, I like the way they do it, but I'm going to be boring and go with Craig. I want to see numbers in six months' time, frankly maybe even 12 months' time. Let, let's see it start coming through, all that international expansion. Let's make sure that it's starting to deliver, we're starting to see some money, and let's see some liquidity come back into the share, particularly if you want to be investing rather than trading. So for now, I'm going to say not hot. Two not hots for Digicore and a speculative hot if you're a trader. Moving on to Cash Build now. Cash Build reported a 7% decline in diluted headline earnings per share to 664.5 cents for the year ended June 2011. Revenue was 6% higher at 5.667 billion rand, while operating profit was flat at 239.3 million rand. A final dividend of 139 cents per share was declared, up from 127 cents in 2010, for a total dividend of 296 cents per share, compared with 233 cents a year ago. Market cap on cash build is 2.4 billion. They've got a price earnings of 14.4 and a dividend yield of 3.1. Craig, coming back to you in, in, in in Cape Town, we saw the trading update from them. What was it, uh, three maybe um, three weeks a month ago or so? Told us broadly what we were going to see. I must say, I thought the numbers were fairly strong, considering the consumers still finding it tough out there. Certainly, construction's not happening very much, and they're not really in that construction space. But the broadly, they're coming through, and they're massively cash generative. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we had the trading update from PPC today just to give us an idea of what's happening and yeah sales are not uh, coming through we can see that in cement and obviously it flows to other parts of the building industry so um, they've done well perhaps in that environment um, if you stripped out the BEE transaction uh, 50 million odd which obviously they couldn't deduct for tax neither it changes things quite a bit um, because it obviously now means a 40 percent tax rate um, and if we take that out you would have seen growth in, in HEPs of about 28%. So um, looking in that context, actually these results are not bad at all. Let's turn our attention to Jonathan now with the tech analyst standing by. 
It looks like it's a nice trending share cash bill, but there's some consolidation coming through. Absolutely, Rafael. I think that uh, the, the great longer term trend is still up. It's still very much bullish. That can be depicted by the rising 200-day moving average. Again, the three-year channel that prices have been trading on. But I think that's just concentrate on the from the first quarter of 2011 till now. Prices are, are really consolidating, and there will be a breakup on either on the upside or on the downside. Um, my suspicions is on the upside, but uh, being a little bit more conservative, I would rather wait for that actual breakup above the 95.50 before I look to go long on the, st of the stock. But what happens if we break below that level? Okay, so if, we, if we're looking at breaking below, first of all, the price needs to close below this, uh, this 90 Rand level. Then we could be looking at testing the long-term three-year trend line at that 85 Rand level. And then again, I would look to be a buyer at that 85. Craig, bringing it back to you in Cape Town, I, I mentioned they're not really construction, but one of the things which I picked up from their statement, I mean, you know, they, they put their customers, uh, home builders, improvers, contractors, we understand that. And I think maybe in tough times, you're more likely to retail the kitchen than, than build an entirely new kitchen. But they also talk about large construction companies, government-related infrastructure, which says to me that when construction really starts to play, we're going to get a bit of a double whammy. We'll have the consumer back there shopping, and we'll have the, the bigger builders, maybe not the Marion Roberts, but certainly the bigger builders, coming into that space and also adding to their bottom line. Yeah, look, certainly um, they've got the Bucky, Bucky Brigade mar market and in rural uh, uh, um, situations they, they're selling there. And you can see from the margins, 22.5%. So you're not gonna, probably going to get the very big contractors buying at those sort of margins. But um, uh, there, there will certainly be an uptick as, as the general construction market improves. But as you say, it's quite nice that there is still maintenance in your small home building and in your rural development that they're still benefiting from. And I like those margins because you just see a little slight increase in, in revenue and it has an effect on the bottom line. Cash bid is all about stores, Craig, and it's a model that's certainly working quite well for them. But the question is, there must be a natural limit to the number of outlets that they can have. They've built five new stores, refurbished 14, four have been relocated, three have closed down. How sustainable is all of this? Well, look, it depends on where your geographic footprint is. And uh, if you expand into Africa, there's a lot of development happening there. And I certainly think that would be the way going forward for a company like Cash Build. And what we also see is their like for like operation expenses only up 5%, which again shows management really being on top of things during tough times. Often in, in, in the boom days, those might run away, but what we want to see now is that control. And it, what, what it's showing to me, it's, it, I'm seeing good management come through from the numbers, from the balance sheet, from the cash flow statements, guys who are really on top of their business and really got a, a firm hand on the tiller. Yeah, no, no, you know, look, I've, I've watched this company for some time now and they, they seem to get the inventory levels right. Uh, um, uh, they, they really know what, they, what they're doing if you compare them with some of the other operations. And so, um, yeah, I'm leading towards hot uh, in, the in, in the sector. I think it's uh, certainly a nice retail uh, player. You, you, you talk about it, the retail, they're also saying that the first eight, we uh, sorry, first nine trading weeks, they're seeing 8% year on year growth for same stores. Um, a lot of their growth is coming through, through the, the, the new acquisitions we mentioned that they're going into Swaziland, they're going into the, the neighboring territories. And I suppose for them broadly, your supply chain here isn't such a problem. It's not like Clover with milk getting the product to it. They can broadly take it and replicate it and go into Swaziland. They can go to Namibia. They can perhaps even go a little bit further up in, into, into sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, uh, they seem to be buying an existing operation there in Swaziland, which I'm assuming is struggling. Unfortunately, we can't see the financial effects of that. They haven't disclosed it. And uh, obviously, once all the boxes are ticked, tick, that'll come through. Um, but we know Swaziland, uh, what the story's been like there, and, and certainly there hasn't been much much growth in that country. But um, there's other opportunities too, Mozambique, etc. And so I, 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 I like um, the prospects for the company, even though the growth in South African market might be a little bit confined. Coming back to Jonathan on the wall, if it breaks below 85 Rand, where do we put our stop loss? <laughs> <laughs> you should have been stopped out already. If it breaks below <laughs> that. Now, I, I think, uh, again, at that 85 Rand level, remember, if your stop is, it will be just below the 85 Rand level, so around the 84.50 or so. But again, it depends on the closing price, not on the intraday period or the intra period or the time frame that, that the trader is working within. So uh, again, you know, buying it now and hoping that it breaks on the top resistance, you're looking at a 10% risk at this particular point in time. So it's just a matter of bidding your time and how much risk can the trader take 
and everyone is individually, you know, they've got their own risk profile. So, so one's got to be a little bit more patient, wait for less of a risk to get into this market. What's your risk appetite then, Jonathan? Do you think that cash filled is a hot stock? Well, I do, I do think it is. Again, I'm going to be conservative to say that if it does break and hold above that 95.50 level, I would look for profits around the 120 Rand level. Uh, but if it doesn't break that level, then I'm going to be looking to wait it out to around the 85 Rand level for me to buy. All right. Coming to Craig in our studio in Cape Town. How do you feel about Cashfield? Is it a hot stock or not? Well, re re management's already guided us that revenue in the first nine weeks or so of this year was up about 8%. Um, we're not going to see that BEE figure in, in next year. So I think co considering that, it's, it's, it's hot. Hot for Craig. What about you, Simon Brown? I like it. I, I have a bit of appetite for construction, uh, uh, a bit of a contrarian <laughs> view there. Um, and I like Cashboard. I, I, I think it's great looking management. As Craig said, we're not going to get that BE deal coming again, so that will be out of the numbers for next year. They, they got a, a decent ish nine weeks. It's not nine weeks, isn't a heck of a lot, but it's a good start. I like them. And I, 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 I put my faith in the consumer. The consumer's coming back slowly but surely. They're spending a bit. We're seeing the banks lending a bit more money. We've seen some of the guys being a little more aggressive there. So I'm going to say cash board, hot for me. So you're basically saying that a re-rating of the construction sector is on the cards then, Simon Brown? I, I am, but don't hold your breath because <laughs> you might turn blue. I, I have been saying that for pretty much all year. It, it, it will happen. Construction stocks are ridiculously cheap. Uh, this year, next year, 2013, uh, it, it, you might need a lot of patience. <laughs>